Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Benjamin. I'm the director of academic events, and along with Mario and Aryana, um, I have the honor to be organizing this event today. Um, it's our last event of the year, but also our first Nobel laureate event um, in nearly two years. And we're very honored to have Professor Card with us today. Um, he probably does need an introduction, but I'll hand over to Professor Dustman, uh, who will do that for us. Professor Cart is class 1950 professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and the director of the Center for Labor Economics and the Econometric Lab at Berkeley as well. Uh, and he works there with many uh, talented labor economists. Um, the, uh, his career has been, um, well, determined by a number of appointments. Before he joined Berkeley, he was teaching at the University of Chicago uh, and then Princeton University. Uh, David Hart is an extraordinary economist whose work is focused on labor economics. Uh, within this field, he made fundamental uh, and groundbreaking contributions, many of which drove the literature uh, on economics in new directions. Uh, and also influenced other disciplines uh, in the social sciences. Uh, most remarkable for, for me about David's work is that he addresses subjects that are of utmost importance, uh, and he looks at these subjects from entirely new angles. Uh, he often argued and still argues against the prevailing mainstream view in economics, uh, which uh, leads to challenging uh, existing dogmas and developing new avenues uh, for young uh, scholars uh, to explore. Uh, noteworthy examples uh, of this uh, include his work on, for instance, the minimum wage, uh, his work on immigration, uh, two topics he will be talking about to you uh, today, uh, and more recently the role of firms in the evolution of wages. Uh, his early work was instrumental uh, in challenging the theory-oriented focus of economics uh, and the economic profession at the time in propelling uh, rigorous empirical and data-based analysis to the forefront of academic research. When I uh, finished my PhD and went back uh, to Germany, I was facing a hostile, uh, so to say, environment uh, as an empirical researcher because empirical work wasn't taken seriously uh, in, uh, in, in pretty dogmatic theory-dominated uh, uh, professions uh, in continental Europe. Uh, and a few years earlier, uh, the same situation faced David uh, in the United States. In my opinion, David Card's role in the evolution of empirical economics uh, cannot be overstated. I myself came across David's work uh, in uh, my thesis work uh, in the early 1990s when I uh, read some of his papers on immigration uh, and decided at that point that I wanted David to be part of my thesis committee. My supervisor didn't agree on that because he thought, uh, well, I should be more modest uh, with the people who should uh, examine me. And then I just told him, well, if you don't invite him, then I will write to him. Uh, so in the end, I think my supervisor agreed to invite David on my committee. However, when my defense took place, I couldn't meet David, uh, who could not uh, come uh, to Europe. Uh, and I finally met him when he received his 1995 uh, John Bates uh, Clark Prize, uh, which is given by the American Economic Association to economists under 40 whose work is judged to have made uh, the most significant contribution uh, to the field. That was basically at the height of a very intense debate about the minimum wage, uh, with remarkable hostility towards David's uh, and his co-author Ellen Kruger's uh, findings and research, which suggested that uh, introduction or increases of minimum wages uh, basically do not have uh, large measurable employment effects. Uh, this was very much against the dogma at the time, uh, which was much determined uh, by theoretical thinking. Uh, during that ceremony, I remember very well that David was very aggressively uh, attacked by very well-known uh, economists, and as a very young scholar, I was shocked by the hostility uh, towards his work. Now, uh, 
over the next decades, uh, we had lots of empirical work uh, coming out, a uh, wealth of studies uh, which all uh, underlined and supported the early work uh, of David Carter on the minimum wage and so in many other areas in economics where he challenged uh, existing dogmas. Uh, for this work uh, and for his empirical contributions to labor economics, uh, David received the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences uh, in uh, 2021 uh, and uh, that was uh, in my view the most deserved prize uh, for a very long time. So I'm very happy to introduce David to you who will talk uh, about uh, well, minimum wages and immigration. Uh, well, thanks very much for everyone for coming. Uh, nice spring morning here in London. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Christian, for the uh, inter very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to give a little talk about um, interplay between economic research and, um, and policy. And I'm going to use two examples, um, immigration and minimum wages. As I think probably a lot of students know, and, and certainly lots of public people know, economists appear to be very influential. Um, and it, for instance, in the United States, there's a chief economist in almost all agencies these days. Uh, my old friend Alan Kruger uh, was the chief e economist in the Department of Labor. Uh, later on, had a role in the, as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, and that's actually a cabinet position in the United States. So this is a very high level of, of what appears to be influence. At the same time, there's been, in the last 40 years, I think, significant progress in economics. And so uh, it seems like a time I think to many people where uh, maybe the influence of economists and the contributions that, that they've been able to uh, make with new data and expanding computer power and uh, new methods and so on would be kind of at the forefront. Um, on the other hand, um, as I say here, economic knowledge is still imperfect. Um, and that's, I think, very, very important to, for every economist to remember whenever they open their mouth. <laughs> you know, we can confidently say yes, but actually you know, it's not quite as solid as, you know, it's not exactly like a, the field of chemistry, the simple Boyle's Law or something like that. We're, we're pretty far from that. And uh, it partially as a result of that, and partially because many of our topics are so ideologically oriented, uh, there's a, there, it's never possible to have consensus. So if you have, a uh, famous line was if you had uh, all the economists in the world and line them up, you still couldn't, uh, you know, circle the globe. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to argue today that another explanation is, uh, and we'll see this in particular with the topic of immigration, that when economists are analyzing the topic, we're often missing um, the non-economic, what we would think of as sometimes non-economic factors that are pretty important. So uh, I'm going to be talking about immigration and minimum wages. Um, and traditionally, I, you may not really, I think probably uh, younger people might not realize, but certainly when I was uh, you know, an undergraduate, economists had a fairly positive view about immigration and a fairly negative view about minimum wages. Um, and so I want to kind of start from that basic point, like where we were in uh, you know, late 70s or whatever, and then think about wh how things have changed and what, the, uh, what, was, what has been uh, uh, discovered since then and how that's affected policy. So I've got a little, uh, what uh, Alan used to call side-by-side. -side. So you have your pluses and minuses. So you're comparing minimum wage and immigration. Uh, immigration on the plus side, um, certainly when I was an undergraduate, we, growing up in Canada, Canada is a very large country with very few people. They're all strung across the American border, you know, just hanging on to the warmest part of land they can find. And uh, so if you had Canada and a lot, a lot of other countries like that, Australia, for instance, is that expand the economy, there would be you know, more output, but there might also be some increasing returns to scale. So we could potentially uh, do better. Um, immigration, it was argued, would increase the value of the land and the capital. So historically, uh, business people and uh, the sort of the renter class was very favorably inclined to immigration. And it, it's argued um, from a very standard economic point of view from basically Ricardian international trade sort of models, that if uh, immigration, immigrants come in um, and they're even a little bit different than natives, it'll increase the average wage of natives. 
But there is a, a minus. The traditional view in the minus was that lower wages could result as a result of immigration to the subset of natives who were most competitive with immigrants. And so that uh, topic was really the one that I spent most of my career working on, on the immigration side. Is that we've got all these pluses and this one minus, and so let's think about the minus. On the minimum wage side, um, it was almost all minuses. <laughs> so we had the idea that employment, if we raise a bit of a wage, we're going to have fewer jobs. You're going to reduce incentives for investment. You're going to raise prices. The only traditional uh, positive view, a possibly positive view, um, uh, it was raised in some studies as, as early as 1940s, was it might be possible to raise the relative income of low-wage workers. So um, my perspective on that topic, uh, the, the two questions that I focused on and I'll, I'll address are these two. Um, sort of the big minus for immigration and the leading negative for minimum wages are in some ways related. Um, on the one hand, both of them are sort of focusing on what are the employment consequences um, or outcome consequences for these uh, people that are potentially negatively affected by the minimum wage. So, um, and the, these perspectives that I mentioned the, the, in the side-by-side -side were largely driven by taking very simple supply and demand type models with maybe some equilibrium, so you possibly have two sectors and some equilibrium uh, model, and thinking about how the labor market would be affected in that conceptual setting with the perfectly competitive um, supply side and perfectly competitive demand side. So basically the model of the labor market that was developed by John Hicks in 1932. So this is a, if you actually think about what we do in labor economics um, in, in the kind of traditional side, it's mostly Hicksian economics from 1932. And it's kind of interesting to go back and read that because even Hicks himself eventually kind of repudiated most of that book, but uh, it's still very influential in our field. So what have economists been doing? Well, uh, one way to think about what we've been doing over the last 30 years and the kind of research program was really to try and, first of all, evaluate those benchmark empirical models with evidence and then reconsidering alternative theories that in many cases long existed but were sort of pushed to the side because it was thought that the, the benchmark model was likely correct. And I guess the headlines, and I'm going to talk briefly about these two sets of findings, the, one thing I, the two things we want to take away from the talk, I guess, in terms of what I believe we've accomplished in these two areas, on the, on the immigration side, many people, especially uh, newspaper reporters, I'm often asked by newspaper reporters what's going to happen about immigration, and they have a completely Malthusian view. So they have the idea that more people means lower wages. So that's the idea that uh, Malthus developed thinking about the great death and, and the effects of population growth. And I'm going to argue that that model is probably not a good starting point for immigration. And so if you could just throw that model away and start afresh, you're going to be much better off. Similarly, on the minimum wage side, I'm going to argue that employers set wages. Uh, that in fact, almost everybody's wage to the economy employers choosing a wage with some degree of market power. Now, not necessarily a lot of market power, but some degree of market power. So a typical setting then is not that wages are set in this abstract market, but rather it's exactly the same kind of setting that we use in industrial organization to describe setting of prices. So when you're thinking about gasoline prices or hotel prices or any price of consumer products, uh, you really should be thinking about employer uh, firms setting prices with a market in mind. And I want to argue that that's the right model for, for employment as well as for, uh, for wage side as well as for the product side. So let's uh, start with immigration. So most people, especially I think uh, untrained people, uh, think about the simple idea that if there's more people there has to be lower wages. And it kind of, I'm not, I've never been quite sure where that comes from. Growing up in Canada that wasn't quite as compelling because it seemed like we had too few people and maybe we'd be better off if we were a little bigger. But this idea was proposed by Malthus in his famous 1826 essay on human misery. So basically, after the great death, incomes were actually higher for quite a number of centuries until population came back and drove everybody back to the margin of subsistence. And so his, this negative perception is really motivated or uh, uh, understood in terms of like agricultural economy with a finite amount of land of different qualities, and so when you have a low population, people can use the best land effectively, and then as you get more and more people, you're pushing them to the less and less effective land, 
and average margin, the marginal product of work is gradually driven down. And his idea was that that would continue until uh, basically we got to such a low wage that the next generation could just barely be bigger than the current generation. But uh, in contrast to this view, it's important to keep in mind that in fact, larger countries don't necessarily have lower wages. Inside of any given country, it's typically the case that the highest wages are in the largest places, the largest cities, and the lowest wages are in small uh, places. In fact, many countries try to promote population growth, like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And so there, there is something else going on that we need to kind of think about. So. Um, the, the resolution to the Malthusian paradox in macro, so when you take a macro course, you often study abstract population growth and sort of growth model. And in those models, population growth isn't necessarily a problem as long as capital can keep up with population. And so that idea was really developed in the late, uh, in the late 18th century, early 20th century. Um, and so economists realized that, uh, that you could avoid the, this Malthusian trap if we could just have enough investment. And in that case, um, it, as long as uh, immigrant flows are the same as the native population, then all you do is replicate the economy. So there's no, basically with constant returns to scale, you essentially have double the population, double the capital stock, everything stays the same, all the wages are the same. Now, if the immigrant flows are not as diverse as the native population, then you could have some negative effects on the groups for which there's a more than proportional increase in supply of labor. But there's sort of two fundamental features of that model that you need to think about. First of all, how do we define diversity in the labor market? And secondly, how big are these uh, crop effects? So if there's more of one particular skill group, how big an effect does that have on their wages? Is it uh, order of magnitude of like one, or is it order of magnitude of 0.1, or is it order of magnitude of 0.001? So those are uh, kind of conceptual issues that I think it's, it's kind of hard to explain to non-economists, but are fundamentally come up as soon as you sort of start thinking about this in a, in a um, slightly post-Malthusian uh, framework. So the research agenda then in, in immigration, to some extent, has been really thinking about how do we measure the diversity of immigrants relative to natives? That's actually a harder thing than you think about. It's closely related to the problem that you have when you're thinking about weight, uh, price setting for products. How do you say this computer and this computer are the same? They're obviously different in some dimensions. And people are just like uh, pieces of uh, products in that way, that there's some diversity and there's some similarity. And you might think, well, those prices should be the same, but maybe not quite the same. Uh, and the research, I think, over the last um, 30 years, at least in the US context, has, has argued that a first order cut, not necessarily the, the, the end of the, of the ways you do it, but the first order cut is you need to distinguish between college and non-college workers. Um, so that, that's driven by very big differences in the types of jobs that those people do and very um, noticeable changes over time in the relative wages of college versus non-college workers. So it's very clear that in the US and other labor markets, college workers and non-college workers can actually be paid quite differently, and that gap can change quite quickly. It changed very quickly in the 1970s. The year I graduated from college in 1978 was the low point of the college <laughs> return to college. Uh, but within, and actually just around that time, uh, an old friend of mine, Richard Freeman, wrote a book called Overeducated in America, in which he argued that uh, there were so many people coming into the workforce with this high levels of education that it was going to kill the returns to education. Uh, within four or five years, however, the return to education bounced back and has been pretty much rising or been steady ever since. So nowadays, almost everyone I think is aware that the financial return to a college education is very high and as high as it's been you know, throughout the last 100 or so years. In terms of uh, US immigration uh, differences, um, the evidence on diversity is quite interesting. It turns out that natives and immigrants are very similar in terms of the fractions with uh, at least some kind of a university education, about a third of both groups. So uh, to the first order approximation, that suggests that maybe, when we, even though immigrants and natives aren't quite the same, if the main dimension of uh, differences is uh, college education, then these guys are probably not very different. And so 
these concerns about relative pressure of inflows of immigrants onto certain skill groups might go away. So then the next line of research, uh, the next thing that, and really the thing that I guess I probably contributed most on is how to get credible evidence on the um, immigrant inflow effects with this framework. And there's a, a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, one way is looking for big shocks. So the common idea in labor economics these days is spread to other fields in economics is to sort of say, well, is there something like a natural experiment? And I wrote a, a paper many years ago looking at the effect of the uh, Marielle boat lift, where a large number of people, about 150,000 people, came to Miami over the course of just a month or two, uh, at, at leaving from um, Cuba to Miami, where the big expat community helped them move across. That's why it was called a boat lift. Uh, and that uh, experience of that boat lift suggested that, in fact, it was very hard to detect um, big employment effects, even on, for instance, the non-white population in Miami. Uh, and so uh, now it, it's important to realize that the, the kind of data that was available then, and especially in the United States, was fairly limited. So there's some uncertainty. You can't say that there was no effect, for sure. But you, you can say, well, there didn't seem to be a large effect. Interestingly, that sort of research program, uh, built, focusing on big effects, has been um, followed up with other evidence. But this is a, one version of the kind of evidence I had. This is showing the log of the average hourly or weekly wage for Miami and a set of other cities uh, grouped together synthetic Miami. And this isn't actually the data set that I use. This is a, a data set that was constructed by Giovanni Perry, uh, one of my PhD students many years ago, uh, trying to update my method. So he basically, in the time since I did my work, there was much more research on trying to figure out how to find this synthetic control group, it's called. And interestingly, you can see, on average, real wages uh, in the late 70s and early 80s were falling. That's a kind of characteristic of the United States. Um, and for lower wage workers, and this is for people with less than, uh, less than high school education, high school and less. Um, and, uh, but they were fairly similar in these two groups. And you can also see they bounce around a little bit, so you can't really see an effect of 10 cents an hour. So, you know, 10 cents an hour, not, you couldn't say that that didn't happen. But you could probably argue that wages didn't fall by 50 cents an hour or 10%. So that's, that's, a, that's the nature of that kind of evidence. Um, following my paper, there has been a, a number of other interesting papers. Um, there was a couple of studies of, for instance, at the end of the Algerian War, there was a mass uh, repatriation of all the uh, colonialists from, to southern France. Uh, similarly, at the end of the Angolan War in Africa, in Africa there was a huge movement of um, Portuguese colonists back to Portugal. Uh, and interestingly, um, probably the biggest of these mass exoduses was the arrival of uh, Jews from Russia uh, at the fall of the Soviet Union to uh, Israel. And that was like a massive increase. And in all three of these cases, it was hard to find large effects. Um, although, uh, interestingly, there was pretty strong evidence of massive increases in immigration, uh, investment, excuse me, in the case of Israel. So it looked like the labor market was working the way you would think if you took this non-Malthusian view. A second way to try and identify effects of immigration is to look for enclave patterns. This is particularly useful in the United States where there's many, many cities, and many of these cities for historical reasons, kind of specialize in certain groups of immigrants. So Cubans go to Miami, Polish immigrants go to Chicago. Filipino immigrants in the United States go to naval-based cities. Okay, now the reason why that's true is because after World War II, Filipinos had a special uh, exemption in the law and they could work on naval bases uh, without any visa status. And so there, if you think of the, if you look at the United States and drive around, you'll go to a place like Vallejo, California, or Norfolk, Virginia, and you'll say, these two places are very far apart, and yet they have one thing in common, a lot of Filipinos. And the reason was because they're naval bases. And so that allows you to find uh, places where if there's a lot of people leaving the Philippines, they're going to go to those cities, because they need to go where somebody speaks the language, where there's some connections. And if that happens, if there's a big exodus from, from the Philippines, then we can find these highly uh, affected cities, and we can compare them to other cities. It's a more attractive version in some ways of the Marielle boat lift. It's not quite as big a shock, but you have multiple treated cities to compare to other control group cities. Uh, 
And uh, I'm going to just show a, a graph here where you can use this idea to project not just the flows of labor total, but you can also predict relative flows because the type of immigrants that come from Poland, for instance, in the United States tend to be relatively well educated, whereas the type who come from Cuba tend to be quite low educated. And so if you know which country is having an outflow, you can actually calibrate where there's going to be a relative change in the fraction of people who are high versus low education. And a version of this exercise is here. What I've predicted is the relative inflow to each city, each point here is a city, of low educated versus middle educated immigrants as a fraction uh, in logs, basically as a fraction of the share of those two skill groups in the city before. And this is a log scale, so it's a remarkably large variance here. So if you've got cities to the right, which are mainly affected by immigration from Mexico and Central America, where there's massive increases in the relative supply of low educated workers. And you've got cities to the left where there's actually increases in the relative supply of highly educated workers. And on the x-axis, I've got the, uh, the relative wage of dropout workers, workers who don't even complete high school, relative to people with high school education, which is the, the modal group of educated workers in the United States, about 45%, so kind of the, the benchmark. And you can see, despite the very wide range on the x-axis, there's no correlation on the y-axis. So this is kind of an, another piece of evidence. Um, what about the longer run? Well, uh, growing up in Canada, a very interesting long run comparison uh, for me has always been the difference between Montreal and, and Toronto. When I was a kid, Montreal was by far the more interesting city. Toronto was, <laughs> its, it's uh, nickname when I grew up was Hogtown, believe it or not. So it was an extremely unattractive place. Saturday night, because the bars closed at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Montreal was like completely, uh, you know, teenage nirvana. Um, it was a really exciting place, and something happened in the 1970s. What happened was, basically, as a result of uh, changes of legislation and so on, uh, Quebec decided not to allow very many immigrants unless they spoke French. And a lot of and then, in the 1980s and in, into the 90s and 2000s, as Canada started to see more and more immigrants from Asian countries, basically they all went to Toronto and, and Vancouver. And so Toronto is a much different city than it was when I grew up there. Now it's basically like London, more than half the people that live there are immigrants. Many of them are immigrants from Asia. And that really changed the country and made a huge difference, or excuse me, really changed the cities. Now, there's another recent paper, which I think is probably the most interesting paper I've seen in the last year or so. I was just talking about this with Christian last night. And this is a, a, another long-run comparison. It compares what happened to smaller towns and villages in uh, part of West Germany, right on the border between the two sectors that were controlled by different allies after World War II. So Germany was divided up into different regions after World War II. One part was controlled by the Americans. That went um, pretty much from like Stuttgart all the way to Berlin. One part was controlled by the French. That went from Stuttgart over to the French border. And uh, after World War II, there were massive repatriations of Germans from Poland and Russia in, back into Germany. And uh, so there were massive inflows. And these two regions differed in their willingness to accept them. The American version, basically, the American controlled sector basically accepted these arrivals. And the French controlled sector, for a variety of historical reasons, did not. And so there was pretty large increases in population in the American sector relative to the French sector. And these guys, um, Ciccone and Dimchik, did a really interesting kind of discontinuity type study with the border, looking at the border between these two sectors, uh, which is still kind of, uh, it was based on a kind of highway. Uh, and there's amazing differences in their long run incomes and in the population density, even to this day. So it's a kind of example, uh, I think, of the, uh, the other side of immigration, which is possibly long-term benefits of immigration from increasing returns and a little bit of an increase in density. So uh, my view on this comparison is that we've basically, the evidence that we've accumulated largely says that these lower wages for directly competing natives, there may be some effect like that, but it's very small relative to other trends in the labor market. And so maybe shouldn't be the first order of concern that we have about immigration. Maybe we should be thinking about other longer run things like um, returns to scale and uh, other aspects of diversity. Now, on the policy side, 
So my view would be we, economists are always in favor of immigration. The evidence, if anything, has become more favorable toward immigration. But on the policy side, I would say the, the, all of the policy changes in the last 20 years have been negative. So uh, in the US, immigration policy tightened remarkably after 2001, after the 9-11 episode. And again, very much tightening under the Trump administration. H-1B caps and the cap for skilled immigration are now severely binding. Uh, tech companies are complaining like crazy. Refugee policies in the United States are now extraordinarily tight. Last year, there was only between 10 and 20,000 uh, refugees in the entire United States. So basically, the United States has gotten out of the immigration game. And I, I, there's similar reactions in the UK. Obviously, people know about Brexit. I, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, <laughs> And obviously, the key thing about Brexit was migration. Uh, and so you can sort of, I think you could argue that all of that research that we did has not really had an effect. Now, let's go to minimum wages. The backstory on minimum wages was the Econ 1 textbook thing that draws a demand and supply curve and says you impose a minimum wage, there's going to be fewer jobs. The implicit assumption in that model is employers set wages. Um, and employers don't set wages, but take wages as given, and so therefore, they, if you raise their wage, they're going to have to uh, reduce employment. But what happens if employers set wages? What happens if employers have a little bit of market power? Well, Joan Robinson in 1933, one year after Hicks, uh, showed that in that case, imposing a minimum wage will increase employment. And so in, uh, the intuition for that is if there's a lot of vacancies, which, by, by the way, walking around London today, that looks like there's a lot of vacancies. Um, <laughs> And that was actually true in New Jersey in 1992 when Alan Kruger and I did our study of um, minimum wage increase that was impending in, in uh, New Jersey at that time. There was a remarkable uh, phenomenon in the streets of Princeton where every store had a sign, just like the restaurants in, in London, every store has a sign, help wanted. Okay, you start you're thinking, well, if everybody wants help, why don't they just raise the freaking wage? Um, well, the answer is that you don't want to do that because you have to pay more to incumbents. So and firms are always thinking about, sure, I could pay more, but I'm gonna to have to pay more for the people I've already captured, so I don't wanna necessarily do that. So, how do we credit, get credible evidence? Well, we can do um, the big shocks. So the big shock idea had been done in the 1940s um, um, in a couple of cases. Uh, the analysis at that time was interesting, but it, they didn't really understand, that researchers at that time didn't really understand how important it was to have a control group. So they would have, often have like treated towns in South Carolina and North Carolina where the minimum wage was introduced not showing huge effects of the minimum wage on employment, but not really having a comparison group. So Kruger and I did this uh, analysis that got a lot of attention uh, looking at New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where we had collected data before the minimum wage went up in both places, and then waited till the minimum wage went, went up, and then collected data again from the same stores, and didn't find much evidence of an employment effect. And there's been a huge uh, literature sub subsequent to that uh, Many cases doing much more creative and better comparisons than we were able to do. Much bigger data sets, many borders. So really innovative work, um, including work by people at, at, at UCL. Um, so nowadays there's these cross-border studies. Um, there's also some really interesting international evidence. In 1996, UK introduced a minimum wage. At that time, a lot of UK had, had sort of had wage councils into the 90s. They got rid of them for a while. Then they introduced a national minimum wage. There was not a huge increase in, in unemployment or reductions in employment. Uh, 2016, Germany introduced a national minimum wage. Uh, a lot of German economists who are a relatively conservative uh, group uh, for the most part, including some of my own former PhD students who were very strongly opposed to this. Um, and it turns out that the, the employment effects of that uh, introduction of minimum wages was not was very hard to detect. There, was some, there were things going on in the labor market, but there wasn't necessarily a big loss of jobs, uh, much to the consternation of, <laughs> of that crowd. Um, so Christian Dussman has written some uh, research on that. Um, so it's now clear, I think, that the employment effects of modest minimum wage increases are very small. Uh, and outside of the minimum wage literature, there's also growing evidence uh, from lots of different uh, sources that this idea of employer wage setting power is pretty important. So when we look at the minimum wage side, uh, I think you can say that we've been pretty, the research has really shown uh, that this big concern about employment losses is, was probably overstated. What has been the policy reaction? Well, the initial policy reaction, as Christian mentioned, the initial policy reaction to 
Kruger, uh, who was pretty negative. Um, you, you, I, I have a nice collection. This is the thing that you kind of like to bring out with you know, things like this. Some of the nasty shit that people said about you. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Um, this guy won the Nobel Prize. Um, and he said, no self-respect cause to claim that increases the minimum wage and increase employment. Um, because that would be equivalent to denial that there's even minimum scientific content. In, in, he went on to talk about camp following whores, by the way. But anyway, I, I did feel this, I gave the version of this lecture in a public audience in Pennsylvania a couple months ago, so I didn't feel like to put the H word on there. But um, anyway, so what, what was going on? Well, obviously, uh, Buchanan was sort of arguing that not only, if you're an economist, not only do you have to believe that certain, you know, the uh, supply and demand, but you ha cannot believe that employers have any wage setting power. Uh, which seems kind of hard to have that as a scientific point of view. But anyway, that's, that was sort of the view. OK, so what about the policy reactions? Well, as I mentioned that. Um, now, at, so at first, uh, I would say there was no effect of, of the work that Alan and I did. If anything, pretty negative. <laughs> My PhD students used to go out and try and get jobs, and people would start like yelling at them. Uh, but in the, in the years after 2000, I think things started to moderate a little bit. A uh, number of states now have adopted minimum wages quite a bit above the federal floor, uh, it, using an interesting combination of state legislation. And sometimes there's actually voter propositions. So in New Jersey, there's actually in the New Jersey Constitution is now a thing about the minimum wage. Um, the federal minimum wage is still stuck because it's a very ideological issue. Um, so uh, the, the, I would say that the, there has been a change in the policy reaction uh, in the United States and also in other countries. Um, so I, I want to leave the talk and uh, open up some questions. I want, I want to sort of take away uh, my conclusions are the following. We, we now understand in economics much more about topics like immigration and minimum wages. And there's been similar progress in other areas. Um, the state of the art in economics has really changed a lot. Now we have massive data sets uh, in many countries covering the entire labor force or a large chunk of it. And we can really study narrow interventions and broad interventions. And there's a lot of uh, innovative young people working on ideas all the time, coming up with credible uh, new versions of these kind of comparisons that I think are important. And economists have gradually updated their go-to model. So the go-to model in immigration is not just a simple supply and demand curve. It's a more of a, a model of equilibrium of the economy, where there's um, capital can adjust to inflows of labor. And there could possibly be spillover effects, similarly on the minimum wage side. So the, the, the research has really influenced, um, uh, I think, has had some influence on minimum wage policies. but on the other side, on immigration policy, it's not. And obviously, the reason is that um, the immigration issue about employment effects is really a very, very small part of the reason why people are concerned about immigration. So economists, I think, have largely missed the boat, or our models are not particularly well suited to understand the other thing that people don't like about immigration, which is many people are very concerned about the presence of some group that doesn't look exactly like them in their neighborhood or their schools or uh, in their uh, economy. And so that, that concern about the way that immigration changes the entire composition of those around you is really missing from most economic models. It is a way that we understand things like housing policy and, and the way we think about um, people choosing schools. But it isn't really directly, even today, part of the way that people think about how people think about policies like immigration. And I think that. In the future, I'm hopeful that economists will start to broaden out our perspective on that. So let me stop and, and, and be glad to take some questions. some candidates have proposed even $15 as the minimum wage, I believe, right? 
and I will speak to you. Is there any evidence on um, a ceiling that cannot be surpassed, after which there will be significant right. So the way I was thinking about minimum wages uh, with employer wage setting power is the explanation for the bottom line. If you have a high fraction of all workers being paid the minimum wage, then you can have this wage setting power. Then the employers are on their demand curves. So I think the fundamental statistic you need to think about is, are we in a situation where 2% or 3% of the workers are paid the minimum wage, or are we in a situation where it's going to be 10%? or 15%. And arguably, if, if we're in the low range, then that probably raising the minimum wage is not going to have an effect and might have this positive effect. But if you're in a range, if you get to a range where like a, even close to a majority of workers are paid close to the minimum wage, then it, it seems like we're in that other model is going to be relevant. So you, need, you can't have the same model for all situations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first, first of all, thank you for the question today. And my question concerns uh, the recent uh, events going on because of the war in Ukraine. And because of that, we have quite a few million refugees uh, in Europe. But these refugees are uh, mainly uh, women and uh, children. And I would, my question concerns what would be the implications for the labor market because of that. So, uh, for example, there is going to be, let's say, a competition uh, uh, in jobs traditionally. That's yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, for example, with wage Yeah. Well, I think um, I'm not aware of any um, direct evidence. Some of the flows, a lot of the flows of migrants that we've seen, for instance, the Mario Boatlift, that was um, majority male. And a lot of migrant flows you see in the past have been majority male. I'm, it's a very interesting question whether there's a, a particular concern. I will say this, there's, there's quite a bit of literature starting in the 1980s on whether male and female workers are substitutes. Right? It's exactly the same kind of question of high and low educated workers or particular occupation groups. And it, it's, it's remarkably hard to find evidence that they're not perfect substitutes, even though women and men work in somewhat different occupations. So I, I'm not entirely sure that the gender issue would be the is is surprisingly the first order thing. It's more a question if the if the women who are moving and families that are moving are able to work in a pretty diverse set of skills. So maybe uh, up to you know middle of the of the labor market. Uh, I don't necessarily think the gender issue is going to be huge, but I think that's something that would be really important to try and study. And um, that's. The other thing I think that's going to matter a lot is how um, many of the refugees are able to move to other places besides just the Polish border. So if they're all going to have to be staying you know, very close to the, the border of Ukraine, that's going to obviously concentrate those concerns. Whereas if other countries open up a little bit and are willing to help out, and for instance, Canada has a huge Ukrainian population. And many Ukrainians in Canada are very willing to help um, provide temporary or even permanent places for migrants. So I think if other countries step up and open the doors, that's going to help relieve some of the pressure and provide funds. Obviously, there's also funding. I mean, some of these families that are moved, maybe they're, they're, they're not even really that many active workers in that family, at least in where they came from. So that's going to be a more difficult transition for them. So I, th I think that when we think about that population, we've got to think exactly what do we know from the past and also, what does this group look like? I, I hadn't really thought about the gender issue until now, so that's a really interesting question. Thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the use of promotion of refugees who have gone through higher education as a way of measuring level of diversification of refugees. Yeah. But in Asia and generally the East, where levels of education tend to be lower, uh, do you think that's still a good measure of substitutability, or is that an alternative? Well, there's quite a bit of, actually, the people at CREAM have done some research on that issue exactly, like who's substitutable to. Um, so, particularly um, migrants from India in the United States are the most highly educated group in the whole country uh, of immigrants. So, 
But that's partially the nature of the laws uh, restricting immigration to the United States. So the only Indians that can come to the United States are extremely highly educated. And they do extraordinarily well. They earn well above native wages, even controlling for education. And their children do extremely well. Uh, you know, I was heavily involved with a litigation involving Harvard University. And there's something like 10% of the students going to Harvard are Indian second generation students. So it's an amazingly successful group. In Canada and the UK, the in, in flows from India and, and uh, Pakistan are, are more diverse. Um, and Canada and, and the UK, and to some extent US, also have arrivals of people with a bachelor's degree or maybe even a master's degree, but from a slightly lower quality institutions. So that's, a, that's an issue that you can kind of um, study if you say, well, there's different types of qualities of school. Um, and maybe uh, immigrants from one country have what looks like um, a college degree, a four-year bachelor's degree, but actually we should really think about that as like equivalent to a two-year degree. So I think when we're actually studying at the very fine level, you have to be prepared to discern levels of quality. There's also going to be a, in, an interaction between education and language. So if, you're, if you have a high degree of education but in a different language, it's, it's going to take at least some time for you to learn the new language and uh, exhibit your skills in such a way that you can move up the chain. So I think some of the what's called assimilation in, by economists of, uh, in the labor market is arising because of language acquisition and um, maybe some of the training is, a, is not quite the same in one country as another country, so you need to adopt the training. So I think it wouldn't be exactly one-to-one, -one, but when I said that the, the first order effect, the first order cut is education. What I meant was, if you try and uh, do simple um, empirical comparisons between different subgroups of workers, that's the one that stands out and is reliably detectable. Finer and finer partitions become harder and harder to detect whether they actually get paid differently. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't, but it means that you need a really good data source and a really clever way to discern who's divided into what category to really see it easily. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned before that your research on minimum wage has for the past 30 years been more integrated into public policy, even though it's still in today, uh, less so for immigration, as you said as well, for the reasons you mentioned. How do you think, uh, what do you think be a way to better mitigate this relationship between research and the public policy, uh, how it's better reconciled to the two. Well, I think um, minimum wages might have become more popular not because of the research. It might be also because there's been a growing wage inequality and people are looking for anything to help resolve that. And so it's pretty easy, and, uh, and also, you know, the thing about increasing minimum wage doesn't cost the government anything, directly. I mean, if it has a bag of consequences, it could, could ultimately be bad for the economy, but it, it's, so it's an attractive um, thing if you're trying to fight inequality, to say, okay, well, what about raising the minimum wage? So as pressure to fight inequality has risen, maybe they adopted that policy. And you, I, think, I think as an economist, we have to be concerned that you know, policy makers, uh, whoever they are, they, um, they'll grab whatever evidence they can to, to support the position that they want to propose. So I think we have to be a bit humble about that and say, well, it's possible that they wanted to raise the minimum wage anyway, and it just so happened you guys did this research. I, so establishing a causal chain from research to outcome, I would say that's, you know, okay, there's a great natural experiment question for you. <laughs> can you I mean, in science, we can find that, right? You can find that somebody finds a, a way to, uh, you know, modulate a circuit with uh, on a silicon wafer, and then next thing you know, we got transistors, and then the whole world is different. But I think in economics, it's a, it's a much bigger lift. Yeah. I, so I, I think I would hesitate to say we caused that, but I think we have missed the boat on migration because we haven't been able to speak very clearly to this. The elephant in the room in migration is, well, these immigrants don't look exactly like us. And they're not the same religion, they don't speak the same language, um, they wouldn't necessarily have all the same attitudes as, as the native population. And for some reason, it's very easy to get um, kind of a tribal identity thing going. 
And if you're a populist politician and want to establish a platform, then anti-immigration seems like the most obvious place to start, unfortunately. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is more of a clarification question. You mentioned that if employers have a wage setting power, then actually an introduction of the minimum wage can raise it. Would you be able to explain that mechanism again, perhaps with a you know, very intuitive real world? Oh, OK. OK, so um, I, I'm running a, a pub down in, in Islington, we, I went to a pub in Islington the other day. Uh, <laughs> there are such places. And there's a giant sign on the door, and it says, you know, uh, help one. And then there's another sign that says, we'll train you to run a pub. <laughs> right? Okay, so anyway, so what's going on? Well, let's suppose that the pub owner has uh, 10 employees, and they're paying them a, a certain wage, and can raise, you can think about, okay, I could potentially get one more person to come by raising my wage another pound, okay? So I get another person to come, but I'm gonna have to pay a pound to those other 10. So it depends on whether the marginal worker that I get for that 11 pounds, suppose I'm paying 10, I don't know, what, I don't, what, what are people paying these days? 15 pounds? So it's 15 pounds, so I go to 16, I'm gonna have to, it's 15 high? Yeah, you're 10? <laughs> 11. Okay, 11. Okay, so going from 11 to 12, okay? We're making this real here. Uh, <laughs> so that's going to cost me, that extra pound is going to cost me 10 pounds for my existing workforce. Okay, so is it worth it to spend that 10 pounds, or should I just leave the position vacant? So that is the concern you have as, as a price setter. And it's exactly the same thing when I'm like, uh, you know, uh, I'm Mr. Amazon and I'm setting a price on the internet for something. Uh, I, I set a price and I say, well, I can get more customers, but I'm going to have to get less from every customer. So I, I always have a trade off between those two things. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, back to your talk. Um, you mentioned uh, non economic factors quite a few times, and I was thinking, is it, um, since you know, a lot of perspectives on such issues are not driven by rational thinking, is it possible to make our subject more interdisciplinary to actually include those factors as well, and how would that change with the outcomes and how we think about them? It is possible to, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, well, there, there's many ways that you can incorporate those ideas, right? What I think um, sociologists and political scientists, especially political scientists, have long had different ideas about what the group threats, they sometimes call it, and all kinds of things. Those ideas can be built into economic models. That's one way. Another way is you could say, well, I'm not going to have an economic model. I'm going to have a, 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 another kind of social science model. Usually in economics, it's we're kind of a um, we take over everything. So if and you know if somebody's got a good idea, we, we should just grab it. That, that's what we do basically. So I think the way it will work in economics is that somebody will say I've got a way, but but we always have to have things inside of a model, right? Because that's really what distinguishes us. And so the, uh, the a person who comes up with a way to develop a good model of that, that has some useful properties, that's gonna be a great paper. And that, that's, what hap that's what happened with mon uh, monopsony power, actually. So there was a, uh, a set of models that were developed in the 1970s to address, uh, Stiglitz and Dixit, and um, for instance, introduced a way to model a small uh, price center in the equilibrium. And it actually is just a formalization of um, what's called Chamberlainian monopolistic competition. But Chamberlain was basically relegated to the dirt pile of history until these guys came up with a model and a way to model it. And then all of a sudden it became a very acceptable and go-to model. And right? so you, in, in economics, we are model-driven, even the empirical people. So in, in a certain sense, we're, we're beholden to the, the... But if you can come up with a good model, it's going to be a winner. <laughs> so that, that's how I would predict it's going to happen. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Go ahead. Um, Professor Carr, uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, related to the minimum wage. Uh, but I guess not exactly the same. Uh, it's more about the average wage level. Um, so so in, past, in past couple of years, you know, some developing countries have by having a low 
average reach level uh, a good performance in exports and economy. Uh, as the macro economies or state states, uh, industries uh, such as manufacturing are having a hard time. So, uh, some, so there are people arguing that uh, this relatively cheap uh, labor force should be continuing. Uh, otherwise, some companies will not may, may, may not survive. Yeah. I mean, uh, how will you how will you argue against that or that? Um. Well, I think. First of all, it's important to understand that in the long run, manufacturing is, is going to be an epsilon part of the economy. Right? Because the, the productivity in manufacturing is ginormous. Right? So the number of workers involved in manufacturing has been declining in virtually every country since World War II. It's even de massively declining in you know, Canada, United States, Britain, even Germany and Korea. And it, it will start to decline in, in China relatively soon. So, and basically, um, there is always a small, low-wage sector, uh, small in terms of economic importance, low-wage sector for manufacturing, for, for products that are relatively simple and that are almost commodities, like uh, textiles and some simple, uh, simple manufactured goods. But that sector is extremely mobile. So, it, it, you know, British um, economic growth in the in the 1800s was driven by the textile sector. Then the textile sector moved out of Britain and moved to other countries, then it moved to another country, another country, another country. It moves on and on and on. And actually there's famous stories of like they take all the machines from one country and move it to another country. And that's basically going on all the time. So I think in the long run, uh, if you're in a, a given country and the country is becoming richer over time, it's a necessary uh, part of economic growth to shed those low-wage manufacturing sectors. They, they're not sustainable in, 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 higher, in high growth economies. And the economy will move to higher skilled jobs and so on. It's basically like skill bias technical change, but driven by the rise in wages elsewhere. But in the short run, I think it's difficult to, to um, make that argument and say, well, we're going to kill these jobs today. We don't exactly know what jobs we're going to get in the future. So I think there's always some short run you know, trade-offs. But I think the long, long run thinking would be that it, you can't protect those jobs. And it, in Canada, for instance, in, in, the, with, in the NAFTA arrangements with the United States, they basically shed a, a number of sectors. And that actually made, there's some growing evidence that that was actually a good thing to do in anticipation of the uh, movement with, uh, integration with the WTO agreement with um, China. So Canada wasn't affected nearly as badly as the United States because basically they shed all of those workers already. So you, in some ways you can delay the inevitable, you can't stop it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting taking out time from his busy schedule to be here with us today. I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that this was an incredible learning opportunity and thank you for answering all of our questions. As a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present to you an Economist Society. Oh.